technology series for the semester. And uh, today we have Tom Harmon, who's going to be um, talking about clickers, and uh, he'll actually do a demonstration. I see all these little things. So hopefully it'll um, give you some insight as to how you can use it in your classes or help others in theirs. Because I know that uh, there's been an interest recently, and um, and there hasn't really been any kind of concerted effort as as a university to kind of promote this. And so hopefully after today's presentation, uh, and we're also going to record it and podcast it for those who can't make it today, and they can hopefully uh, get a sense of how this can be used. So uh, without any further ado, Tom Harmon. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I'm in, a, in the School of Engineering and um, started using these things about uh, four years ago. And um, I'll try to tell you why I did it. and bit about what I've done with them, what I haven't done, but that might be cool, that sort of thing. And, you know. So as you recall from the uh, flyer, we're going to talk about uh, catalyzing class interactions here with these clickers or audio, audience response uh, systems, the good, the bad, and the RFID. <laughs> so here's what I'll try to get through pretty quickly today. Uh, why I started with these things, uh, how they work what I have done with them, what I haven't tried, but I'd like to. It, it's just the tip of the iceberg of what I've done. Uh, as you'll see, these things actually, the software actually um, maintains all the data that you're collecting through the course of the classroom. And, and, and you, at the end, when you quit PowerPoint, it'll say, do you want to save this session? It's asking you if you want to retain all the responses that you've got. And then you can go in later and generate all kinds of reports, you know, who answered quickly, who answered slowly, who answered incorrectly, correctly, what are the statistics. Uh, if you got clever enough, uh, you'll notice I wrote a marker, a number on those things. Um, I actually uh, marry a student to a clicker, so I know who they are. Not sure if that's uh, I'm probably violating some human subject act, but let's just <laughs> keep that between us. And uh, you know, it's nice because it gives me, if nothing else, it gives me a very quick and free attendance for my class. Um, but uh, if you were to uh, put down some data about demographics of those students, you'd be able to do some slicing and dicing of the data pretty easily. Do I ever have time to do any of that? No, I really usually don't. But uh, I'll show you what I have done and, and see what you think. So if we start off here uh, with a quick question and see if our new response meter works, uh, why are you here today? Because you're interested in learning how these work, you were hoping to find a free lunch, uh, you already know how they work, but you want to watch Carmen fumble with them. Okay, so polling is open, uh, see if there's some responses coming in, we should have, you can see up on top, you can either watch that for yourself or, as I'll show you in a couple of slides, you can set up a timer where they'll actually have 10 seconds or 15 seconds and they'll watch the clock going down if you want to build a little bit of, of drama in your class. They, they, uh, they seem to enjoy that a bit. And then you would get your responses popped up in, you know, right, right in real time. <laughs> Says we had three answers and one person was interested and two wanted to watch me fumble. Which I just did. So my history. So the, the class I teach is called is a Gen Ed course called the Environment in Crisis, uh, and um, this is for um, basically Shaw students who need to take some science lower division science science units, um, but don't really want to take organic chemistry. Think something like that. And so uh, it's a semester long course. Uh, it has a lecture component, it has a laboratory component. And it's, uh, it's a course that tries to talk about the interface between policy and science. So it would, uh, it begs for some discussion and some interaction and some controversial topics. So it's kind of hard to do with 40 or 50 people in the room. So I thought that, uh, one, this was a new type of class for me. Uh, I hardly ever, uh, uh, coming to Merced, I came from UCLA, I never really taught freshmen and sophomore, except maybe an occasional freshman seminar. Uh, I uh, didn't have big classes because by the time you were junior and senior in engineering, your classes are usually maybe 15 people, 20 people maybe. And uh, 
I knew that this student that was in here was not typically going to be keen on science. Uh, and, and so uh, there are some exceptions to that, but for the most part, uh, I found that you know, out of this 50 students, about a third of them are pretty keen on it, a third of them are about neutral, and about a third of them may or may not show up for class. So they're <laughs> not so keen on it. Uh, so, and given all this, um, uh, I'm getting older here in life. How do I, uh, how do I pull the attention of an 18-year-old in this day and age? So I think uh, most of us have uh, probably felt this uh, this way, where you're uh, sitting in a class and you're giving a lecture, and you think it's pretty good stuff, but five or ten minutes into the class, it's just glazed over, and these people are just. It could be anywhere. Nothing is getting through to them. So uh, this is why I really started the class. Uh, I really wanted to be able to interact with them. I'm uh, you know, fairly, having gone through an engineering curriculum and been an engineer all my life, I'm actually fairly introverted myself. I'm not the, most, the greatest facilitator at drawing people out and trying to make them uh, discuss things in class. So this was a way for both of us to kind of break down this barrier and get responses. I can tease responses out of the audience. I'm getting pretty good at putting questions up that are uh, sort of on a controversial note and either knowing what they're going to answer or being surprised by what they answer. But either way, I have something to launch a discussion point with. So when they don't have to uh, talk, they don't talk. They just, they just shoot. So uh, sometimes I just put in things that are kind of random opinions. What would you think of a 10% pay cut to help out California? We'd gladly do it, we'd go along with it, but protest, you would accept it, and would not accept it and would seek another employment, or you would volunteer for 20%. in a minute and we'll actually just build a slide you know, and you'll see how, how easy it is to put it together. So uh, how do these things work? Well, you've got your, uh, your uh, clicker or your uh, sender and then your receiver. And the software uh, is uh, wired up with your license to know how many receivers you're able to handle. I assume that won't be a problem if the campus starts gets a site license or sort of thing. Uh, right now I'm licensed for 50. I was licensed for 50, now I'm licensed for five. <laughs> um, it should be it should be no problem. Yeah, no, there shouldn't be any any limitations. Now. So, uh, so um, you basically you install the software. Like I said, it's gotten much better. Um, uh, Mac and PC versions are, are available, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a second. I've used both. Um, uh, you initialize the RF transmitters like we just did. And uh, then if you want to take one more step, and you don't need to do this, but if you want to know who's holding your clicker, you have to tie the, um, the identification number of the clicker into the, into the list of clickers. And then you can sort them into groups. Uh, I've, made, I've done it to do things like quiz meets where I have teams of students, and I have to make sure that all their clicker scores get added into their total, and that's a, a really nice um, commodity. So the software integrates with PowerPoint uh, seamlessly. I would used to put that in quotes, but now it's, uh, now it's uh, pretty good. Uh, in 2004, it was a little buggy on Windows. It would crash a lot. Uh, the report generating thing was just really wacky and hard to figure out, not intuitive at all. And uh, Mac OS, it wasn't really existent then. Then uh, two years later, uh, pretty good on Windows. Uh, workable but buggy on the Mac with sort of a reduced number of features. And now, um, very stable on Windows and better on the Mac operating system, getting to be more and more. So sort of kind of paralleling the whole 
Microsoft Office suite that's kind of come together and there's less and less compatibility issues. Uh, so uh, it's quite a new version now and I'm just getting used to it because like most uh, professors, I will you know, hold on to a software to the bloody end before I upgrade and I now just finally got forced into upgrading. 